Chapter eight was about posterior inference and prediction. So in chapter six, we learned how to approximate the posterior. And then in chapter seven, uh, we learned what's going on under the hood with the Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, so now we are looking into how to analyze the posteriors that we get from that process. So this chapter is all about um, covering three of the tasks that you would use in posterior analysis. And one of them is estimation. So what is our estimate of the parameter or parameters? The second is hypothesis testing. Does our model support the claims that we're making? And prediction. So what would our model predict if we increase the sample size? Mm -hmm. And this chapter also explores how Markov chain simulations can be used to approximate posterior features and thus be used in posterior analysis. Mm -hmm. And after reading this chapter, I was slightly confused because I was like, why are they covering the three things and then covering them again? And that's because sections 8.1 to 8.3 are covering exact posteriors. So when you're calculating the posterior without MC, MC in section mm -hmm. 8.4 is about approximating posterior is from MC, MC algorithms. So that was the difference. Yeah. <laughs> and I may know those just in case. So our posterior estimates, I should reflect both the central tendency and the variability in a parameter. So that's why we get this whole uh, posterior distribution. And whereas the posterior mean and mode of a parameter just summarize the central tendency. So if you were to just report, you know, the mean in your analysis, um, then that only tells you what the most likely value is. You can see here that the very tippy top. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas with the Bayesian analyses, all of these uh, values in the shaded region are plausible values as well, but they're just not the most likely, like the mean is. So the shaded region is what we, we refer to as the credible interval. And as you can see here, it's a bit asymmetric with more values to the right than to the left. And it's a bit more visible in this other posterior distribution. And they mentioned that there isn't one perfect credible interval. You can have credible intervals of 95%, uh, 85%, 50%, and so on. And the smaller that value gets, the more values that you, the more plausible values that you are excluding. So in the case of the 95%, you're excluding the 5% most more extreme values. And one thing to note here is that these credible intervals shouldn't be understood as um, confidence intervals in the uh, yes. frequentist traditional way, right? Um, I think that's that's something that I had a hard time understanding um, because my frequentist um, background was so strong. I even taught classes at a university level, college level about statistics, frequentist statistics. So. So that that always pulls me in, right? When trying to understand Bayesian analysis, 
So I hope yeah. you don't mind that I am just making, interrupting you, I'm sorry, uh, but <laughs> to contribute to the conversation, right? Because um, credible intervals, and I love that you wrote consider credible intervals because I usually call them confidence intervals and it's because it's CEI, right? But it's, it's not, mm -hmm. you should use different words because they mean different things. So in this case, um, I don't know how you understand it, or maybe maybe tell me if you see it differently than me, or maybe I'm understanding it wrong. But when we're talking about Bayesian analysis, what we have to understand is that it's always distributions. So everything we're gonna talk about is gonna be a distribution. It's not gonna be one value, one parameter, what, like in frequentist analysis, right? That we always go to the mean and something like that. But here it's gonna be a distribution. So this is how the distribution looks like in our posterior, right? A posterior distribution looks like. But we can summarize it by showing the central tendency or, or the mean or the median or the mode and the credible intervals, which are nothing but the percentiles, right? So the percentiles of that distribution. So so I, I think um I think that's that's always um important to note because for the longest time I thought it was the same thing, but it's really not, right? Yeah, I think that's definitely the distinction. And before reading this chapter, I guess I didn't really understand what the credible interval was. I thought maybe it was just the Bayesian form of the confidence intervals. Um, but yeah, I now know how they are different. But what I also think it's important to know, I'm not 100% sure on this. So I need to just make sure that this is correct. And I will ask one of the authors that I follow him on Mastodon and on Twitter. He follows me too. His mm. name is Miles Ott. I hope that's how you pronounce his last name, at least, Miles Ott. Um, so <clears throat> I will ask him if, if I'm correct on this, but um, so the way I understand these credible intervals is that, I mean, if we want to put them in, in, in layman terms or in, in words, instead of just talking about distributions and math concepts or whatever, um, is that we are trying to see how much the posterior resembles the real data. So, or, or the real, yeah, the real distribution, what, what's happening in reality. So the credible interval in a way, it's going to reflect how much the real data looks like the posterior, I think, something like that. That's where I'm a little confused on how to put that in words, but I will figure it out and then I, I'll put it maybe in the in the Slack or something. But if someone has any, any ideas on that, please let me know. Yeah, I had sort of a similar question to that. Like, does all of this factor into how you assess the goodness of it with the posterior? Because I know for one of my analyses, mm -hmm. um, the goodness of it was like how much my simulated data overlaps with the like posterior, the posterior estimate. I'm wondering if that fits into that. <laughs> yeah, that's the goodness of fit. That's something that you do post hoc, right? Like um, after yeah. the analysis is done, then you do a goodness of fit test to see exactly that, what you just said. Yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, it's always the interpretation of what the credible interval is that I am a little fuzzy on, but I will figure it out and then I will put it on the Slack um, channel so that we sort of have one like the definition, this is what it means, right? But I think we understand it, right? That it's um, it's based on the distribution and we're talking about percentiles. In mm -hmm. this case, it, does, it, it has nothing to do with the way um, confidence intervals are interpreted. Like the, the population mean will be contained if we repeat the same experiment 90, uh, 100 times and 95 times, the population mean will be contained in the 
within that confidence interval. That's that's the frequentist way to see things, right? But this is different. This is just this distribution is showing us um, possible values of the parameter. And the credible interval is just showing us 95% of those possible values, or 99 or 80% or whatever, right? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Let's continue. But I will make a note to figure that out. Okay, if I only got that far with my actual notes, I'm gonna switch to a different screen. <laughs> okay, yes. So once we have our posterior um, calculated, then we can perform posterior hypothesis testing. So testing hypotheses directly from that posterior. Um, so in this case, they give the example of, you know, maybe our hypothesis is that fewer than 20% of the museum artists that they covered in this data set are Gen X or younger. Yeah, exactly. We so we can, posterior, because it's a distribution, posterior, yeah, we can actually yeah, say yeah. things like that. Like, what are we trying to show? Ranges, right? That's that's the beauty yeah. of this distribution, yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at the right one. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I think you down here one. Oh, yeah. Um, so here's our posterior distribution, and now we need a, a different one. Well, once you have the posterior di distribution, then you can use that distribution to test your hypotheses. So um, from the posterior model, you can see that the majority of that posterior is under 0. interval, which is 0 0.1 to 0 check, but then you can actually calculate a number or the posterior probability that um, you get by integrating the posterior distribution in that range of interest that you're interested in. So you're interested in testing the probability that 20% of the museum artists are Gen X, so you would calculate the area under the curve only from values ranging from like 0 0.08 to 0 0.2. And that gives you a posterior probability of 0 0.849, so about 85% probability that the that 20% of the museum artists are Gen X or younger. Okay, so this means that your null hypothesis would be, oh, okay. okay, right. So what makes this a one-sided test is, that you're testing a range. So for your null hypothesis, that would be, you know, the greater than 20% of the artists are Gen X, whereas your alternative hypothesis that we just tested is that less than 20% are Gen X. Yeah, so that's the range. 
and we had calculated the posterior probability of RS being gen X at 0 0.85. So once you subtract that from one, the null hypothesis says that 15% uh, are 15% are not Gen X. <laughs> so once you have these, you can calculate the posterior odds, which is the posterior probability of your uh, alternative hypothesis divided by the posterior probability of your null hypothesis. And here we see that this gives us a posterior odds of 5.62. And here's some codes for uh, calculating that. Yeah. And you can use a similar process for the prior probability. So this would be the prior probability for our alternative hypothesis is 0 0.0856. So it was pretty small. And then you subtract that from one. And again, we divide the prior probability of our alternative hypothesis uh, divided by the prior probability of the null hypothesis, and we get 0 0.093. And once we have both of these values at the posterior odds and the prior odds, then you can calculate the phase factor, which compares these two values. And this gives us an idea of how much our um, understanding of Gen X representation in this case changed upon observing our sample data. So we do that, we divide the posterior odds by the prior odds and we get a base factor of 60. So this basically means that our hypothesis about um, having about the Gen X artist is 60 times, oh yeah, the odds are 60 times higher than our prior odds. So this would support our hypothesis. Oh yeah, and they give you a nice little chart for evaluating the base factor. So if your base factor is one, then your hypothesis, uh, the plausibility of your hypothesis did not change in light of the observed data. If it's greater than one, then your alternative hypothesis is more supported than the null hypothesis. And if your base factor is less than one, then your alternative hypothesis is not very plausible compared to your null hypothesis. <laughs> so we move on to the two-sided test. Okay, so this one is different because it's a bit more binary rather than the range. So you want to know whether or not 30% of the museum artists are Gen X or younger. So uh, pi equals 0 0.3 or pi does not equal 0 0.3. But the problem with this is that you can't take the area of under a line because it's just the point because the area of a line gives you zero. And when you try and calculate the posterior odds, 
that gives you an undefined phase factor. So what are we supposed to do with that? Um, and then they ask us the question, you know, uh, recall that the credible interval for pi is 0 0.1 to 0 0.24. Do we believe that this credible interval provides enough evidence that uh, pi differs from 0 0.3? Did y'all think yes? Yeah, so uh, I think it was definitely yes. I mean, they wish there were pictures at every point of the way. <laughs> but yeah, since, since the posterior distribution that we calculated earlier, most of those values fall under 0 0.3, then that also supports our hypothesis here, even though we didn't calculate that area under the line. But another way around this is to redefine your, the area that you're looking for under the line. So in this case, since we can't directly test 0 0.3, they tested 0 0.25 to 0 0.35, which gives you a very tiny area to integrate. And the third type of posterior analysis we can do is the posterior prediction. So when you get more data in, you can predict outcomes in that new data. So in this case, they posit that perhaps the museum gets 20 more artworks. So based on the model we have, uh, what's the number of artists that are Gen X or younger, what number would you predict would fall under that category? And based on our model, if you're kind of thinking like a frequentist, you might multiply 20 by 16% and that gives you the value of three, but this calculation ignores the variability of our posterior distribution. And, yes, so it does not account for the sampling variability in the data, and it doesn't account for the posterior variability of the parameter. So, we did not estimate that only 16% of these artworks are Gen X or younger. We calculated that 10% to like 24%. Yes, we calculated that about 10% to 24% of them were uh, in that category. This area was kind of math heavy, and I got slightly confused, but I think the gist of it is that you want to account for all of the values in your posterior model when uh, calculating your posterior predictive model of the new data. I believe this is what you get once you do that. They actually got 
about a similar value that about three of them would be Gen X, um, but this time they accounted for the full range of potential values. Okay, so that was for exact posterior calculations. And they also delve into how to do these posterior analyses with MCMC. So here is a scan model they made. And the data consists of integers in the range of 0 to 100. And this is because we are assuming our sample size is, that our maximum sample size is 100. And then our parameter is a real value that is in the range of 0 to 1. So that's consistent with the beta distribution and that's our parameter pi. So we specify our model, which is that the number of artists that are Gen X or younger is binomially distributed with 100 draws and a parameter of pi and pi is beta distributed at four six. So once we've done that, we simulate the posterior using scan again. Yeah, and it's four chains, uh, 10,000 iterations, and they set the seed, so we get the same results. Um, once we run our simulation, we run our diagnostics. And we use MCMC trace to um, plot our chains, and we see there's a fuzzy caterpillar shape and no specific upward or downward trend. So that looks good. Our four chains are overlapping very well. So that's also good. And the autocorrelation drops right away such that after five iterations, there is no autocorrelation between that first sample and the fifth sample. And we can also calculate our R hat, which is one. That's less than 1.1, I believe. So that's good. Our uh, effective ratio is 0 0.38. Also good. So now that we've approximated our posterior using the MCMC, we want to approximate the posterior model of our pi parameter. And we have 20,000 iterations to do that with. So this black line is our actual posterior of pi. And then our MCMC approximation is here on the right. And you can see they are pretty similar. Oh, okay. So we have our posterior 
approximation, and we want to uh, set our credible interval. So in this case, we chose a credible interval of 0 0.95. And that ends up being 0 0.1 to 0 0.24. And here it is shaded in in our approximated plus area. So this line uh, signifies the mean, and that's our most likely value. But again, the plausible values stretch from 0 0.1 to 0 0.24. Oh, yeah. And one trouble of running these MCMC algorithms is that you get a whole bunch of iterations back, and it is not always simple to you know, produce uh, summary statistics for that distribution. So in this case, they stored all four of their chains in one data frame. And once they did that, they used P flyers. You know, there was a discussion about how that's pronounced. But they used P flyer to calculate the mean of the parameter pi, calculate the median, the mode, and the lower and upper quantiles. And so again, that is 0 0.10 to 0 0.24. So we want to, again, test our claim that fewer than 20% the, than of the medium artists are Gen X. So uh, again, we approximate the, num the values that are below 0 0.2. And we use that. Okay, so there is an 84.6% chance that the Gen X representation is under 0 0.2. Yes. Sorry, there's a lot of numbers going into my brain. <laughs> uh, so here they compare the posterior model that we calculated earlier to the MCMC approximation of the model. And we can see that they are highly similar. They had a students you know, by hand. And that means we can trust the MCMC. -MC. Um, so we move into the third posterior analysis, which is posterior prediction. And again, we want to account when we get at new samples, we want to account for the sampling variability and the posterior variability in the parameter when calculating probabilities for our new data. So in this case, we use the random binomial function to simulate one binomial uh, outcome for Y prime, so the new data. 
from each of the 20,000 uh, pi chain values. So if you had to do this by hand, yeah, like you would quickly go insane. So it's nice that we have these algorithms that can do that for us. So we set a seed and then we code for a value of y for each pi value in the chain. The lock values. So when uh, our pi parameter is 0 0.13, we would expect that two, two of the new works would be from Gen X or younger artists. When our pi is 0 0.13, 18, we would expect three artists and so on. And basically it does this for 20,000 predictions. And that gives us this distribution. As we can see, it is most likely that when we receive these 20 new paintings, that three of them will be from artists that are Gen X or younger. Although there's also a pretty good probability that it, there's only two. And then our third most likely is that there is four. But the possibilities range from zero to eight. And again, you can calculate how you can reduce your quantile to get rid of those more extreme values. So in this case, with an 80 percent percentile, your range could be one to six. So they covered some benefits of using a Bayesian analysis. And one of the benefits is that you can assess the uncertainty of a parameter based on the observed data. And this differs from a frequentist analysis, which assesses the uncertainty of the observed data in light of the assumed values of the parameter. And I liked what they said here that it's not their writing that's awkward, it's the p value. And it's true because, um, you know, like the Bayesian is more intuitive to the way people think. So we can directly say, you know, there's an 80% probability that the value is between one and six, whereas how they kind of said it, that um, if pi were only 0 0.20, then there's an 8% chance we'd have a third sample in which at most 14 of the 100 artists were Gen X. And that's kind of like a puzzle to work out in your brain. So to sum up the chapter, we learned how to estimate our posterior and get um, you know, mean value as well as the credible interval from that posterior and what a credible interval actually means. And we can compare that to what we know about confidence intervals. We also learned how to how to test hypotheses once we obtain that posterior. And we also learned how to use our model to make predictions when we get new data. And that's my summary of the chapter. Sorry if it was confusing. <laughs> no, no, I mean, some things are very confusing, like that p-value thing. 
yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think I understand it quite well with, with, with I mean I do understand it in frequentist framework but but not in the Bayesian analysis part um yeah but it's it's just <laughs> you know it's, it's very confusing thing but I think for the most part yeah it, it was very well explained in the book and you did a great job of course but it's it's very um it's basically except for some of the post hoc analysis that we do this is basically the the the, the mid and bones of an analysis what what if you're doing a linear regression if you're doing a hierarchical model whatever it is this is what you have to do like like exactly what it's in this um and this is how you interpret it too right like how it is in this chapter so i think i think no it's it's great because next week we start with um with regression models so so it's like mm -hmm. you already know the foundation so now let's start with the analysis that's going to be very interesting because we, we use stand right i've never used stand other than in this book of the exercises that they do here it's going to be i'm kind of excited i'm kind of um, moving <laughs> forward to it yeah so it was it was i mean yeah no it was clear we'll see how we do next week and the following weeks i don't know who's presenting next week let's see I'm presenting the two chapter. Oh yeah, that's true. All right, all right. All of them. If you, for whatever reason, cannot present any of them, or if something happens, let me know, and then I I will jump back in, and then uh, I'll do I'll do that for sure. Send me a DM okay. on the Slack channel if you, for whatever reason, can't. If anyone has any questions or something else that you want to say. Not really. Although I okay. did appreciate their explanation of the base factor. Because I feel like when I first heard of that, I went to Wikipedia and it didn't make sense there. But they laid it no out one. very well here. <laughs> yeah you know what that's true actually that's really yeah i like how they um they put it in with the equation relating to the um alternate and the null hypothesis it was super clear and yeah the only question i had is how do i do that in r you know <laughs> like how do i estimate the base factor in jax or whatever software you're using that's the only thing that i am but at least i understand it now because before i was like you know, people report them in, in in papers and stuff, but I've never really truly understood it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I just heard that it's like the Bayesian p-value, but not really. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the only one that I'm still a little, mm, yeah. But little by little, I feel like learning, I always say this, I, I used to say this all the time to my students, learning, other people have different views, but for me, learning happens in layers. So you read something and then maybe you don't understand it, but then you read it again, maybe in the same book or somewhere else, and then you add a, another layer and you're like, oh yeah, now it's making um, more sense. And then you add another layer when you reread it or you read something else and then that's how it goes. And I even tweeted this week that we um sometimes this is what i do i don't know other people but um in order to understand what i'm reading in one book especially with base analysis i don't just base my understanding of that specific content in that book based on that book alone i don't know if that's making any sense or yes. what i usually do is i go back and forth between books so i'm like using what i learned or what i read here and then applying it to what these other authors are telling me in the base rules book. That's usually how I, I mean, when I really want to understand something, that's how I usually go, right? Like that's, that's my journey, at least, the way I, yeah. I, I do these things, right? Yeah, especially because some authors kind of skim details. They'll be like this, and therefore it makes sense that this. 
and then you're yeah. like no that does not make sense <laughs> and then yeah. some other author breaks it down for you yes the way they they sometimes they focus on one thing or um like here for example one thing that i've been loving about this book i haven't read the whole thing but is that they always make sure to say in words what's in the equations so it's not that just like well so here's the equation because some books are like that like for example i don't know well i'm an ecologist so i, I will always go to the um to this books i don't know if you've seen them or not but these are like the yeah. Mark Carey and Andy Royal books. So those are great, right? Like that's how I started and I love them. But they always go to, so this is the equation and this is the data you're going to be working with. And this is how we analyze it. And you're like, yeah, but can you explain it to me in word? And this book does that. The base rules book does that. And you can actually see it when they say, um, uh, there's like this ex extract that I got today, but it, they put the equation, but before that, or the model or whatever, they say something like, um, recognizing that the dependence of y on pi follows a binomial model, but they put it in words, not just the equation. Like they put the equation, right, the y condition, all of that, but then they also say in words. And I think that when you're starting, that helps a lot, especially for someone like me that English is not my first language. Anyway, I'm preaching to the choir and over explaining things here. But um, thank you so much, Diana, for today's explanation. It was great. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, so I will see you all next week. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, we good rest of your day. Thank you, guys. You too. Bye.